What's up, everybody? Welcome into Southeastern 14 Bets and Ball Games with Edwards and Greason. It is April 4th. We're recording uh, late morning on Thursday, Final Four edition. Let's uh, talk about our good friends at Bet Online. They remain your top spot for all your live betting action and contest. Um, college basketball, NBA, NHL, UFC. MLB are in full swing. Bet Online is your number one source for wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions. All the hoops betting action, along with every sport available at your fingertips with both desktop and mobile access at any time. Head to Bet Online today and remember to use our promo code BELIEVE. That's all caps B L E A V for your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right. What's up, Jay? How are we doing, my man? Uh, Doing tremendous. Uh, Beautiful day here in Chattanooga. Uh, Happy to be with you and and our listeners. And and I I need to ask you this. In terms of a daily gambling consumption, with the Masters being a week away, and now with the addition of spring football, I know that may not be of peak interest. But what is of peak interest is, of course, the Final Four. But this year, more than any other, the ticket prices for the women's title game and the Caitlin Clark effect are higher than the men's title games. And Monday night's Iowa win over LSU was not only the most watched women's basketball game ever, it was also the most bet on women's basketball game ever. And we know from last week you were in Vegas and I don't, you probably weren't there until Monday, but I I just was curious over the weekend, what kind of buzz comparatively for a guy who makes regular sports bet or sports betting trips to Vegas, did women's basketball have to previous years? Well, when were the women playing? Were they They played Saturday? Caitlin Clark played Saturday, Monday. Okay, what uh, do you know? What time she was playing Saturday? It was probably a little early afternoon. Now that's right. against that's against uh, the men's games. I we know there were fight cards. Of course, there's baseball everywhere. Saturday's a big horse racing day in sports books across Vegas. Well, actually, I don't think there were because Saturday was Elite Eight, and they started a late on Saturday. So I think by the time I was in the sports book. Caitlin Clark's game was over, so okay. I didn't – because I was in my room writing and, and doing, like, work stuff before I, I went over. Um, yeah, so I wasn't in the sports book to see it, uh, which is unfortunate. I'm sure the sports book was, was happening for that game Monday night. I mean, I was watching. I didn't even have a bet on it, and I was watching, and I thought it was awesome. Um, no, it yeah. was awesome. It was highly entertaining. It was yeah. – uh, I don't know if we've seen a singular star in their sport since Tiger in early 2000s uh, like Caitlin Clark is to women's basketball. Yeah. Yeah. She's big time, man. She can play. I mean, what she's uh, 12 assists. It was at 40 or 41 points. 41, 12, and seven. Uh, wow. And That's- if you, yeah, she hit nine threes, which ties an NCAA record for men's and women's. And, uh, I mean, and and did it with all of with every person since Huey Long from Louisiana trying to uh, check her, foul her, confront her, uh, instigator, however you want to go. It just it we've got a lot to get to, and I know this is a Monday review. I just the the transcendental nature of what Caitlin Clark has made women's basketball in the conversation she has brought to it. I just was curious on, on if you heard anything different in Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, I wasn't in the, you know, while I was gone, like I had the red eye late Sunday night. And then I just wasn't down there in the sports book when Caitlin Clark was playing on Saturday. And I, I don't even think I was cognizant of the fact that they were, playing because i was which is uh, how most of us are in vegas we're not yes. cognizant about a lot this it's is one true. of the reasons why they build those really big <laughs> hotel rooms and give you five dollar lobster dinners because we show up 
we drink too much, we bet too much, and 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 then we leave with way less money than we showed up. <laughs> that, and we tell our kids they're going to state schools. So, uh, hey, kids, have you thought about junior college for the first two years? <laughs> right. All right. Um, so let's. We do have one SEC team. Um, Alabama, for the first time ever, they had only uh, been to the Elite Eight once. I believe it was 05 with Mark Gottfried. Um, I believe that was a Rod Grizzard team, uh, the lefty two guard. Uh, but anywho, um, and actually, you know what? I remember that year they lost actually in Phoenix in the Elite Eight to UConn. So now. They get past the Elite Eight, and they go to Phoenix again, and it's UConn again. Uh, right now, Bet Online has UConn favored by twelve, but at a minus one hundred five price. Um, it, it looks uh, pretty much split, like half and half with the other books. Some at eleven and a half, some at twelve. The minus one hundred five price uh, makes me believe that Bet Online it will. If it gets much more Alabama action, it'll be moving um, to 11 and a half. The total, uh, 160 and one half. Money line, uh, get back on Bama, plus 600. Uh, your thoughts on this game, Jay? Uh, I don't know how you can dance. A, there are so many great movie quotes that have been lodged in my head. And I'm going to go to Kevin Spacey in The Usual Suspects right here. And when uh, he was asked, why didn't he take a shot at Kaiser Sose? Of course, he was Kaiser Sose. But he goes, how do you shoot the devil in the back? What happens if you miss? Right now, UConn is the devil. I mean, they are steamrolling everybody. And you're not going to be able to shoot the devil in the back. You're going to have to punch them in the face. And I don't think Alabama has the depth to punch them in the face. Now, I will say this. My favorite, bit, uh, my favorite number you threw out there is Alabama's going to do everything in their power to play fast, and they're going to do everything in their power. I would love look – look at our friends on Bet Online. What is the first half total? Because I think it's going to be a phrenic pace. And not unlike how UConn and Illinois kind of danced with each other early and then UConn just put the foot down because they're – UConn's deep now. A lot of people don't realize how deep they are. They got nine guys averaging – double-digit minutes or more than nine minutes a game. And they can beat you in any way you want to play. So Alabama's going to play fast, and I think UConn's going to say, fine, we'll beat you fast and be yeah. completely content to beat them 105-90. Yeah, so the first half line is UConn minus 6.5. The total is 76. Uh, Bet online has got it shaded to the over at a minus uh, 115 price. Um yeah, so uh, from what I'm hearing from you, it sounds like we're on the same page. Um, I don't like to lay big numbers like this, but this juggernaut uh, has been so good to me, and I, I do have some uh, good stats on it. So with the line being 12, uh, these stats are relevant, and that would be that um, – UConn has won by at least 13 in 25 of its 35 games and has won by double digits 27 times. And Alabama has lost by 13 or more six times. They lost by 14 uh, to Florida in Nashville, lost by 18 in Gainesville, lost by, let's see, 22 at Kentucky, by 18 at Auburn, by 20 at Tennessee, and by 13 uh, in Phoenix to Arizona. Um, and UConn's won these four games by 25, 30, 17, and 39. Well, and the comp here is UConn is Auburn level deep, but with NBA guys on the perimeter. And, I mean, if Mark Sears is going to have to be Caitlin Clark for, for this game to be close in the final four minutes, in my opinion. I, think they I, I, I I prefer the totals in this game, uh, even as high as it is at 160 in a Final Four game where uh, 
folks will slow it down and and because all you're wanting to do to quote Jim Valvano is survive in advance. But I just I I think this game's got <coughs> nitrous oxide in its veins and is going to be played at a at a, at an at an unbelievable pace. Yeah, and Alabama number one in uh, pace in the country, and like you said, I think UConn will be glad to run with them now. Uh, I will point out, though, that the under uh, has cashed in five straight for UConn, and it's actually on an eight and one run. And Stetson scored 52, Northwestern 58, San Diego State 52, and Illinois 52. So, uh, well, none of the, none of those offenses compare to what Alabama does. 100, percent 100. And so, I mean, yes, that is, and. It goes kind of back to our point that UConn is happy to beat you at whatever you want to do. We know Stetson, we know Northwestern, and we know San Diego State. They they were walking it up slower than most church league teams. Alabama ain't going to do that. Even if it's 20 to 2 to start the game, Alabama's going to push. And that's all they can do. Now, that said, with the hierarchy of the appearances of both of these coaches, man, they're rubbing a whole lot of folks the wrong way. You could have like a fundraising auction of who wants to pay the most money to take a swing at Dan Hurley or Nate Oates, and you could pay an entire season of your high school rec team. Hey, did you see their travel issues yesterday, by the way? Who? UConn? UConn? UConn. Yeah. No, I did not. Oh, wow. Okay, so check this out. They were scheduled to leave, and apparently the NCAA handles all travel plans for all teams. Perfect, because the NCAA has got such a great track record of handling everything. Correct. So they were scheduled to leave at 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, but there were mechanical issues. They got pushed back to 1130, and if they were leaving at 1130, uh, the crew – was going to be working more hours than are allowed to work like on overtime. So they had to get a new plane, a smaller plane. And at 1.05 a.m. Eastern, Dan Hurley went on his Twitter account and said, wheels not up. And then uh, Matt Norlander of CBS Sports, uh, in his little report this morning, he uh, – had sources on the plane texting him at 1.33 a.m. that we are now speeding down the runway. Okay, so 1.33 a.m., they're leaving Hartford, Connecticut. And that's what, like a 90-minute flight, Brian? No, a little longer than that. A little longer than that. And, and, but, you know what, I'm (laughs) 6'4", and I fit perfectly into airplane seats. So I can only imagine what a 6'11", dude is is folded up into in in in, in aisle A7. Well, what they did uh, the initial flight they were going to their whole party uh, but they um some people they had a smaller plane so some people got booted and are, are coming later. So, I mean, I don't think they got to uh or actually so CBS thought they were going to land at 5.28 a.m. Eastern, but ESPN had a report they were landing at 6.30 a.m. Eastern. Now, obviously, that's 3.30 Pacific. They were supposed to be um, at the arena today for practice and media obligations at noon. Uh, what I was reading early, early this morning, like five hours ago, was that um, that uh, the NCAA might push their time back just for today. But, I mean, whatever. I mean, we're still – 48 hours away from tip, but right, not a convenient thing. All right, so back to – well, let's talk for a minute about how well Alabama played uh, last week. I thought they were on the ropes a couple of times against North Carolina. I mean, they were down eight at halftime, and Clemson got off to a great start. Um, but with the way Alabama played in the second half of both games, and how about Grant flipping Nelson against Carolina at crunch time? The uh, uh, he has he's one of those stories that that March is made on. Honestly, I mean it is it's in the fabric of March on these guys that I mean 
I think back to all the wonderful images of like Bryce Drew hitting that that game winner for Valpo. And then you I mean, you just guys who come out of nowhere. And yeah, Scotty Thurman was a great player, but it wasn't like he became an all NBA type of dude. But he was a mother in March at, at Arkansas. And you think of so many of these guys who rise to the moment and and Grant Nelson's right there with them. And, and it's also one of those storybook conversations where he just doesn't look like him. And then he goes out there and he plays like him. And it's, it, it's, it's one of the great things that you, you look up and, and is the fabric of what this event truly is. That in the brackets, and, and my bracket is completely, completely. Wow. I mean, it it is it's as trashed as a fraternity house after Mardi Gras. Yes, mine is too. So check this out. I don't know if you saw this. So in the last twenty five seasons of the NBA, the WNBA, and Division One NCAA men's and women's basketball, um. This has happened once, and it was Grant Nelson against Carolina the other night. 20-plus points, 10-plus rebounds, or I guess it's when I say five, like at least five, or five-plus blocks. So uh, I assume that means at least five. 10-plus free throws made, 60% field goal percentage, 100% three-point percentage. Nobody's done any of that except for Grant Nelson. He did all that against Carolina. Um, and then the second half against Clemson, it was mostly Sears, but all the other fringe guys were hitting threes too. So, I mean, look. No, no they, Alabama, Alabama's played great. Yeah. Uh, but their fringe guys better be able to step up because uh, UConn's fringe guys are better than your fringe guys. Oh, 100%. And Grant Nelson is overachieved. His counterpart at UConn, going to be a top 25 NBA pick. Yeah. So, I mean, okay, yeah. I mean, it, he's he overachieved against a undersized perimeter defender against UNC, and he and he showed and they all all the all the secondary options showed out against Clemson. But those guys are going to be the best player in their church league in three years. The UConn dudes are going to be either playing in the NBA or playing overseas. So, uh, you're, Sears is going to have to go Caitlin Clark. Seriously. Yeah. It's yeah. Got, he's going to have to put 40 on the board. And, you know, it's not a bad kind of hedge both ways. Player prop Sears if you, if you think Alabama's got a chance to compete in this thing. And even, I mean, because he's going to have to put 35 on the board for them to be in a meaningful moment. Uh, with Rafferty saying onions in the last uh, five minutes of this one. Oh, I love how he got so pissed when um, Janelle Davis for FAU did not attack the basket in the inner regulation. He was like, where's the blow by? <laughs> All right. So I'm trying to look up. Uh, let's get a well, hey, is, hey, speaking of that, one, I appreciate Jim Nance walking away on his own timetable. I think Jim Nance – I actually – Jim Nance is really high on Jim Nance. He's got – he's had a great job for several decades, doing the Masters, the every third Super Bowl, the Final Four. Uh, yeah, that's it's a wonderful gig. Uh, I like the chemistry with the, the new play-by-play guy. I and Eagle is great. Rafferty is great. He needs – a cantankerous sidekick like the Muppets had with Waldor when Waldorf and Stadler sitting up in the balcony and heckling everybody. Cause I mean, Grant Hill just chimes in with, with some niceties. And Grant Hill. I, I just don't, I mean, I like Grant Hill in general, but absolutely. I, He's but also one of the great. What if guys, if what if Grant Hill had not gotten hurt? Sure. I mean, he yeah. was going to be yeah. one of those dudes, Yeah, but no, no, it, we we need Rafferty to have a counterpart, not 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 a, not a yes man. Yes, or just not, or just I and or, or just a two man booth, which gives there us more Rafferty. Yes, which 
I can't get enough. I mean, if you had to have three guys you can have beers with, I mean, I think it's Raftery, Larry Bird, and Barkley for me. Because I, I, I can't have beers with Coach Spurrier because I've got him up here. He can only oh, come Hey, down. can I tell you a great Spurrier story? Sure. Early in my journalism career, I got to go to the SEC media days back when they still had a golf tournament. This was even before you and I worked together in Marietta. And Spurrier, I'm I'm – I'm playing in the golf tournament with Spurrier. I've played Augusta National twice. I've never been more nervous in, with a golf club in my hand than on the first tee with Steve Spurrier standing in the group behind me. And I, hit, I, I swing a mighty lash. And I hit the ball 50 miles in the air and 50 yards down the fairway. And Spurrier, as he's walking up to put his ball in, with his visor on, you know, he's all, hey! Big fella, that's like an elephant's ass, high and stinky, and then just smoked one right down the middle. I well, from there though, I mean, I played much better, but man, oh man, what a what a great dude to be around. Oh I, man, he's the he's the best. He's the goat. He's he's the, the, he's the goat in terms of. I used to love how, and golly, we're getting sidetracked because we got a lot to get to. But I used to love how he'd like sit down in the news conference after the game, going, "Yeah." We're 17 point favorites. Probably should have been about 22. And then just go right into the conversation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man. And he just, he, uh, poor Ray Goff. Poor Ray Goff. Just got oh, absolutely. I got a great Ray Goff story. When Ray <laughs> Goff was in, when, <laughs> when Ray Goff was informed that he was inducted into the, because Ray Goff was a good football player now. Yeah, he was no. like SEC player of the year in the yeah. 70s. Yeah, yeah. As a quarterback at Georgia. Yeah. When he got inducted into uh, – you and I will forever call it the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. And they have a Hall of Fame for that game between yeah. Georgia and Florida because the rivalry is so great. Ray Goff got inducted into the Hall of Fame of that game. And his first comment was, well, which side nominated me? Because Florida wore him out so much as a coach. He went over. He went over yeah. seven, I think, in that game, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, and seven. All right, get us back on track, man. You got to be all a better right. point guard than this. I'm shooting terrible shots right now. Okay. Um, all right. So, what are, I'll give you my picks on UConn, Alabama. I'm going with UConn minus 11 and a half. I mean, not only have they won 10 in a row in the tournament, they've covered in all 10. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier. They've won by uh, at least 13, 25 times. And, um, yeah, I'm going with UConn. I'm also going to go with their team total to go over. It's either 85 and a half or 86 and a half. They've scored 87 or more 14 times, but Alabama has given up 87 or more 16 times. And Alabama's given up at least 87 10 times. In its last 14, Ken Palm has UConn number one in offensive efficiency, Alabama 104 in defensive efficiency, and we, we've talked about Alabama's pace. So, well, let me those, ask you this now: Does it, are those not contradictory? Because if you get a UConn blowout in terms of game script, if you get a UConn blowout, that could really hurt getting over 87 as they slow it down and, and they get right. indifferent. I mean, I, I, I like, I like the UConn <laughs> side and I, I don't think there's any way I'll play any unders or any Bama, but I like all of them more in the first half than I do maybe in the totals. Yeah. I, I get what you're saying. Cause that very well uh, could happen. Um, yeah, I mean, they kind of slowed down against San Diego State. Well, um, I mean, you're just going to need Alabama to, to be in it at least right. tangentially till the end, maybe foul a little bit, and then an eight-point lead at the inside eight becomes a 14-point lead at the inside four. Yeah. And, so, and, and that, can, they, that, can sure, that can surely happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's – you know, both could definitely happen. Um, I'm going to have more on UConn minus 11 and a half. Um, so now their first half bets barely got there last week. In fact, Illinois had that 
uh, sideline out of bounds with like three seconds, and they got a pretty good entry pass. I don't know. I guess the guy bobbled it. Um, if you would have got a bucket there, I would have lost uh, my first half bet. Uh, and they only won by like two or maybe three on the first half bet uh, with San Diego State. So I'll probably do a little UConn minus six and a half in the first half, but baby, baby play. And, and you know, the team total is over 41 and a half in the first half. I'm not against going over that, um, but UConn minus 11 and a half, my main play. What's your main play or plays? Uh, my main play is I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take UConn to lay the number. But anything beyond that in terms of total and in either game or team would be first half options because I think the energy and pace, you don't get to the 10 minute mark and feel like it's hopeless because you're down 26 in the first half. You're still running, you're still pushing because you got time to to create and and the and conversely, if UConn's up 26, because I think we're both high on UConn because right now it's a juggernaut. It is it is a steamroller uh, rolling over snails. And there is just – but UConn's still going to push and guard and play in the first half, even if they're up 22 at halftime. And some of that, too, the even in terms of – Talent's going to rise in the first half because you're going to have nervousness despite the practices with an open gym. You're going to have some mediocre shooting in the in early because it's a new gym for almost all these kids. So that's my play. You know, what's so wild and points to what a juggernaut UConn is – they made three of 22 from three against Northwestern, 14%. They were three of 15 against Illinois at one point mid-second half and still had a 30-point lead. Let's see what they finished from three against Illinois. Oh, they finished three of 17. Well, like where they're, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna stifle Alabama on both backboards because UConn is just a superior rebounding team. Mm-hmm. But – uh, I I don't think it's if UConn wins, it's certainly by how much, and uh, which leads us to who are they going to see on Monday night? Correct. And um, but last thing on Alabama, it looks like Latrell Wrightsell is going to play, so that is good uh, for their depth. One of their best shooters, forty four percent from three. He he missed uh, both of last weekend's games and uh, has practiced and is probable. Um, all right, so bet online uh, for the, actually the curtain jerker uh, at 6.09 p.m. Eastern. That sounds be- dirtier than it should. Right, it's just the, uh, or the lid lifter, whatever you want to call it, the first game. The first all right. one. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. you're about to get us to a place that people can't watch us on their work computer. Okay, bet bet online as Purdue minus nine with a total of one forty six and a half, and the money line price on NC State is plus three fifty. And I, I mean, how can you not have nineteen eighty three NC State vibes? I know a lot of our listeners aren't old enough to remember that, but I've got eighty three NC State vibes. Um, Thurl Bailey, Sidney Lowe, Derek Wittenberg, uh, Cozell Lorenzo McQueen, Lorenzo the, late, the late Lorenzo Charles, Terry Gannon coming off the bench uh, against Five Slamma Jamma. Um, I got to go with NC State plus nine. All right. They've won nine in a row. They've won outright in seven straight as a dog. Um, I'm going with NC State plus nine. What say you? One, it's my favorite bet on the board of the weekend. Is NC State of of the at least of the Final Four is NC State plus the nine. I'm also going to put a taste on the money line at the plus three and change. A uh, couple things. Purdue shot their shot and they got lucky to beat Tennessee. NC State played okay and they dominated Duke. I mean, and I and again we talked last week at this point in time that we both kind of predicted Purdue because 
you don't have a true answer to at for seven four until seven four shows up. But conversely, when DJ Burns takes Zach Eady to the perimeter, good luck with that, Frankenstein, because you're not going to be able to guard that kid off the bounce. Now, you may move pieces around and try to do different matchups, but that's not going to work either. And I think NC State may have the second best – they may have the best Robin in DJ Horn. Yeah. Yeah, and, he's good. And And because DJ Horn didn't play well against Duke for the first 28 minutes. And they still were in complete control of that game. Uh I'll be really to see one. I need to tip my visor to you. You completely called Houston getting beat by Duke by the Blue Devils and the officials. You completely called that last week. Well, I didn't know Shed was going to get hurt, though. So I feel like my calling that, I, I don't feel like I should get full credit. I'll take some credit. Well, <laughs> but conversely, uh, after all this blowback, it'll be really interesting to see how the officials very much so. call Zach Eady in the final four at this high stage. Cause I don't know how many people watched. I watched every minute of Purdue, Tennessee, because of where I live and what I do for a living. He shot what 20 free throws, played 39 plus minutes, and got called for one foul. Right. One. Yeah, he shot. I want to say it was – I've got it right here. Um, 22. Yeah, I thought it was 22. So, I mean, I know Tennessee fans can get a little – the world's against us at times on social media. Shocker. But, I mean, you look up and a guy plays 39 minutes and hauls in 16 rebounds. So, he's around the ball a lot. Scores 40 and gets called for one foul? And Tennessee shot 11 free throws. Edie shot twice as many as the Vols' entire team. I mean, because if anybody's going to get him in foul trouble, Tennessee didn't have a good answer, Of co- obviously. I mean, we just read the stat line. Of course, they didn't have a good answer defensively. But they didn't have a good offen- an answer offensively with a big who could put him in compromising situations. Right. DJ yeah. Burns will. DJ yeah. Burns will catch the ball 15 feet from the basket. And if Edie is if somebody else is going to guard him, then he'll go post somebody else up. I'm 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 completely with you at NC State plus nine. And I'm almost talking to myself into the magic of March and NC State on the money line. Oh, I have talked myself into that. Oh, not for much, just a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm going to make sure that if Purdue wins by eight or fewer, it's still a uh, really nice profit. Um, yeah, so um, we, we both like NC State. Here, I will point out a couple more stats. Um, so Purdue has only won by double digits uh, four times in its last 13 games, and one of those was against Grambling in the opening round. So it's not like Purdue is a juggernaut like UConn and beating everybody by double digits. That's not happening. And NC state's on fire and is just playing with, um, big time confidence. I I like the Wolfpack. You like the Wolfpack. I do. I'm hundred percent on the Wolfpack. it, It, and as I said, when we started this back and forth, uh, I think I th- um, uh, it is it is the Wolfpack minus nine is easily my favorite play. I would actually suggest to our listeners you kind of get on that now because I think the sharp money is going to come to the Wolfpack uh, before tip. And this one, I think nine may be the best price you're going to get. So uh, I would li- I would look to that now. And then the other part of this, I think. NC State has talked them into the talked themselves into how magical this run is. And they 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 now don't there's a great thing that happens in sports when you believe you're gonna win, which is more important than expecting to win. There's also a great thing in sports when you don't think you can lose, and that is where NC State is. Conversely, 
I think Purdue, there's a whole lot of mission accomplished that this group was shooting for the final four or bust. And well, now you're there. So, and I mean, I got to tell you, the Zach Eady uh, press conference that nobody believed in me, I've had it up to here with the nobody believed in us. And as much as I love Caitlin Clark, she said at, that in, after they beat LSU, nobody believed us at the beginning of the year. Bull snot. You're the best player on the planet in your sport. Everybody believed in you. you right. Iowa has Jordan. Of course they believed in you. Of course they believed in you, Zach E. You're 7'7". Seven, seven. You're 300 it, pounds. I mean. Is, are you getting vibes uh, of Georgia saying that after they beat TCU 90 yes. to two. <laughs> Nobody believes in us. What? You were preseason one. I mean, right? or preseason two. Everybody believed in you. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the hypotheticals because, I, I, and I know you're going to be on the same page with me. So let's say UConn and Purdue advance. And the, these are, um, are, are posted at uh, various books. In fact, or do, did you have the bet online uh, pulled no, up? No, I, I don't have it up. Yeah, I don't okay. have it. All right. I don't I'll, have I'll, the futures. No. Okay, I'll get it. Uh, uh, but but while I'm getting it up, how about you take a guess at what Purdue and um, and UConn and how many UConn would be favored over Purdue in the finals on Monday? I would say between four and a half and five and a half. And if that's the case, I'm going to talk my wife into we're making a house payment bet on the Huskies uh, because uh, they're, they're going to wear Zach E out. They, yes. Hey, his, his, his seven foot four, 300 pounds is going to have to go baseline to baseline for 40 full minutes. And uh, I, my favorite bet is NC state plus the nine. And one of the reasons it's my favorite bet is that if it loses, I'm going to double that and put it on UConn to beat Purdue badly. Brilliant minds think alike. UConn will be my biggest bet in a long time. <laughs> uh, the, and, and regardless who they see in the title game. Because NC State will be 12 or 13. Actually, NC State is 15 and a half. And if yeah. NC State wins against Purdue, I am not laying 15 and a half against NC State. I might be on NC State. I don't know. We'll have to see how these results go. But actually, um, so you, you said four and a half, five and a half. Uh, Bet Online has got UConn minus five and a half to uh, Purdue. Bet Online has UConn 14 and a half to NC State. It was FanDuel that had 15 and a half. So it's probably going to be. And yeah, I, mean, I think 14 and a half is more uh, appropriate. All right. So if it's Alabama, NC State, if the underdogs prevail, Alabama, well, what, what would you think Alabama would be favored against NC State? Two. That's what, that's what I think it should be, but it's five and a half. Um, well, could, uh, then I then I would love NC State in every direction because yes, all and that number will only go up because of the knee jerk reaction of Alabama beating the juggernaut that was UConn, right? And if it's Purdue Alabama, Purdue is favored by five. So now our listeners, if you have a bet online account, you can go bet these right now. If the matchup does not come to fruition, it just uh, becomes a no play. It cancels. Um, so I, yeah, I you know what it, it 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 double pleases me that with those odds that you just threw out that about being on NC State minus the nine because in a or plus the nine I'm sorry it in a perfect world right here Purdue wins by five yeah and we get to bet against Purdue against either UConn or Alabama. Because if you think UConn's going to try to run Zach Eady up and down the floor, what is a Nate Oates offense going to do to that big boy? Right. And, you know, that would be a rematch. They play December 9th, and um, Alabama actually had uh, multiple double-digit leads in the first half. Um, 
and it was like um, tied or, or one point game there with like five minutes left. But Purdue uh, pulled away in the last few minutes and won 92 86. So it wasn't over. Um, and that was on a neutral court in Toronto, actually. So they have that would be the only potential rematch uh, of these four um, games we have. And um, we hey, actually side have a question right here before we move on to our next topic. <clears throat> so I think we've covered it pretty well that uh, were UConn or no and over or no in the UConn, Alabama, and we're all about NC State against Purdue. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not playing the, uh, the total uh, pregame uh, other than UConn's team total over 85 and a half. Um, the, and uh, not... If ahead. I gave you even money odds uh -huh. that Zach Eady ever made an NBA All-Star game, are you betting yay or nay? That's a great question. That's a great question. You know, with the way, unless you're like Embiid and you can dribble and shoot threes, the and centers the are kind of centers are getting phased out. Well, NBA. think about it this way: he's he's a couple inches taller than Embiid and four inches taller than Nikolai Jokic, who is their point center. Right? They're they're. I mean, name the name the last truly good back-to-the-basket post player in this league? Rick Smith's? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I mean. I mean, I really don't think I can, I can think of a team that just feeds the post constantly like, like Indiana always did. They would start with Smith's, then they would run stuff for Reggie. Now, um, Ewing, Ewing also. Um, but but we're now talking two decades, bro. I know. I'm trying to think lately, and I'm, I'm – yeah. I mean, so and he's slower foot than right. Smiths or Ewing. So if I'm gonna he's say gonna match no. up with, I mean, if he's gonna match up with Embiid, Embiid's gonna just beat him off the bounce from yeah. the top of the key every single series. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I I'm I'm gonna say no. I, I would too. I, would, yeah. I mean, heck, I would even make the bet at plus odds that in five years. If he's earning a check playing basketball, it's overseas. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's possible. I mean, what, what was our big guy uh, from Iowa? Uh, Luca Garza? Yeah. He, I don't know if he's in the league anymore. If he is, he's, he's probably not probably somebody's accountant in, in the greater Ames area. <laughs> Perhaps. I think he might be over in Spain or Italy for a few years before going to Ames or Iowa City. Uh yeah, okay. Um Musselman. This is this is wild. I mean, they had not been Arkansas had not been uh to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament, which they were a perennial mainstay uh under Nolan Richardson during his uh fantastic tenure. They had not been to a sweet sixteen since ninety six. Muss's second year. Um, I'm not, I think they were 20 and 12. I don't know if they were going to make the tournament, uh, the COVID year, but year two, elite eight, year three, elite eight, year four, sweet 16. I mean, this, this tenure has been spectacular and one disappointing 16 and 17 season. And he might be by injury now. I think it's fair to muscle me. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. They under they underachieved. They were pre they were preseason 10 in the country. And but you had some dudes get injured. You had some dudes start feuding and the the back and forth completely unraveled everything uh, that they had hoped could be uh, in Fayetteville. But this is honestly. You mentioned this before we started today, and this is one of those puzzling situations of be careful what you wish for. And being an Auburn graduate, I I, I have like a grad degree in sports fandom uh, dysfunction. Struggles. Dysfunction uh, is better. So uh, kind of has a little bit of the tail end of the Malzahn era where both sides just – want to figure out the divorce 
And then, of course, Auburn hires Brian Harson, and it goes from bad to worse. So, uh, because if you're now – it's important that if you're going to part ways with a coach or let a coach walk or, or fire somebody that you've got a real, you have a real conversation of who are we going to get who can take us forward. If you let Musselman with the resume that you just unloaded, who let's not forget five years ago, six years ago, to Nevada was one of the hottest the names in, uh, on the market. To Nevada to the sweet 16. So, if you let him go and the whispers start going in the coaching community, who's going to – I mean, what big fish are you going to lure in knowing the unrest and that, that you can go Elite Eight, Elite Eight, Sweet 16, one bad year, and then everybody was put, is trying to help you put moving sign uh, – for sale signs in your yard and moving boxes in your truck? I'm going to agree – and disagree with you. I'm going to agree with you in the sense that uh, frustrated Arkansas fans, if he doesn't take the USC job, I, I will agree with you in that they shouldn't be like, oh, well, we don't want you. You know, they shouldn't be like, they, they should want him back, I think. But, uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I don't know if you were implying, uh, like, I still think Arkansas can go get a really good coach. I mean, it's a great job. In my well, they'll, they'll money whip somebody. Right, exactly. They got plenty of money. They have a, their own special NIL group for basketball alone. I've read that here in the last day or two. Um, yeah, they've got one of the best facilities, the fans, it's, and the fans are back into basketball. I mean, they couldn't help but not be that into it for 20 years because they sucked. Well, the league's only going to get tougher, and they're recruiting – advantages to get to the SEC is about to get a lot tougher with Oklahoma and Texas joining. So they're not going to be the, the main SEC option with LSU into the Dallas area or into some of the Midwest parts. Um, I mean, I, I get what you're saying. They, I think it's an overreactionary good riddance type of vibe that we're getting from Arkansas fans online, but the other part of this is, how does he not take it now? This is like right. cheating on your wife and then saying, you know what, baby, I want to come back home. And, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i defending Musselman as a coach, but I'm not de defending him necessarily as a decision maker in this career track. And, and, oh, and I will say this. Now, if, if he's literally out in California – now, now that I am on the team of Arkansas, but I don't think he, why can't he just do a, a Zoom? I mean, he's from Southern California. He knows the area, or he's from San Diego, I think. Um, he doesn't need to go fly and visit the campus. And now, if he does that, you know, I was trying to think about, I don't, the one coach I can remember who did that in a coaching search and ended up going back to the school was when UNLV was uh, courting Mick Cronin when he was still at Cincinnati. He went, to Vegas, they wined and dined him, but he went back to Cincinnati. Ended up staying. But I can't remember another time recently where I, you know, that happened. Uh, Lane Kiffin getting wined and dined at Auburn. Oh, was he in town? I don't know. I don't know if he was in town. I'm I'm not right. one of these airplane number followers. Sure, uh, but uh, that that one. Yeah, that was, was bad. Yeah, not it was closer than a lot of folks thought. Yeah, but Ole Miss still had a good year last year, yeah. and well, so. I mean, I, I think one of the one of the most underrated strengths of Lane Kiffin is he connects with his locker room like few guys in the modern era. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an underrated part of Kirby Smart's appeal too, because Kirby's got a great balance of. Yeah connecting with the new generation of players and still having some old school discipline. Kirby's more of the new school connection type of vibe. Cause I can tell you this, I was in the hallway at Udawa high school here in town. Kiffin was at Tennessee and he was recruiting a kid named Jacques Smith and he was sitting on the floor 
drawing up plays with like freshmen and middle school kids. Just being a guy talking football. He's a head coach at Tennessee in Chattanooga, Tennessee, waiting on to talk to a five-star defensive end. And he's just drawing up ball plays with some some teenagers. And and I I just took a step back and went, that dude gets it. Yep. That dude gets these kids. Yep. So I wanted to ask you a question because the Gators are getting an official visit next weekend from six foot nine power forward Sam Alexis, who has spent his first two seasons in Chattanooga. Um, have you watched him play? Are you familiar? Did not take in a Chattanooga game this year. I am familiar, and I and that team that team would have been a really tough out if they'd gotten into the tournament. They had a they had a terrible loss. They blew a huge lead against ETSU in the, in the SoCal tournament, tournament. Uh-huh. and they were destined to meet up with Samford. In my opinion, they, those were the two best teams in the Southern Conference. Kid can play. Uh, he's a versatile kid. Um, but I mean, there, there are a lot of kids that are probably going to get rated out of the Southern conference, which plays pretty doggone good basketball. Uh, the Furman kid, who's a great, who's a very good player. JP Pekis, I think is his name. Uh, he's been mentioned in the same breath with Auburn, but he will be courted by a whole lot of folks. Uh, it's funny. You look up. I can remember years ago, I would always watch the McDonald's All-American game to see which stars were headed to which schools and be impact dudes. Now we just look at the portal rankings. Now you now you now you scan the portal <laughs> and say, all right, this guy scored this guy scored 17 a game in, in, in the Mountain West. And now right. he wants to come into a power five and get paid right. because I know Zach Eady is going to win the college player of the year. He he was no more or less valuable than what Dalton Connect was to Tennessee. And by and the way. That's Dalton. a dude who, who was at Northern Colorado after going to a junior college over the last couple of years. And now he's, he was the SEC player of the year. He's a first-team All-American. And Dalton Connect will be an infinitely better NBA player than Zach Eady. Yeah, and, and two things in this tournament that are going to get lost because they came in losing efforts. Dalton connects spectacular performance in the Elite Eight. 37, I think he finished with. It, it, and it, yes. And, and Walter Clayton scoring 13 points in a row for the Gators to tie the game at 100, which everybody forgets about because they made the – you know, game-winning jumper and one by two. But uh, had, we, had Florida won that game, I mean, that was like almost some Reggie Miller uh, against an, at MSG type of stuff. Um, all right, let's uh, wrap this bad boy up. So, in review, your picks. Uh, give me UConn laying the number. Give me UConn in the first half. And uh, NC, NC State, State plus the nine with a – Slight taste on the money line, getting the plus 300 or whatever you can find. Uh, check out our good friends at, at Bet Online, but also don't be afraid to shop and find your best prices, friends. It, it is your money. And speaking of that, as I'm looking at the NIT finals tonight, uh, most books have Indiana State at three, but if you like Seton Hall, and I lean that way, uh, Bet Online has Indiana State at three and a half. So if you like the Pirates, it's basically a road game in terms of the crowd. Uh, but I do think Seton Hall's a little better. Uh, a little worried about the crowd. It's not a strong opinion, but I, I lean Seton Hall. Um, so my favorite pick, I, I'm going to say my favorite pick is UConn rather than NC State, but I like both a lot. And then uh, smaller plays, UConn team total. Uh, over 86 and a half, uh, not against minus six and a half in the first half. And um, Brian, yeah. let me throw out one more that yeah. I know you and I are on. If it works out, you and I are both high on whoever is playing Purdue Monday night. Yeah, um, I would like uh, 
So that would be Bama. Nah, I don't know that I would like Bama. Well, they'd be five and a half point underdog. Isn't that what we, uh, yeah, I think that's what it is. Um, I don't know. Would there be a letdown after, uh, yeah, no, I probably would like Alabama five and a half. I think I'd and like I was, and I'm in love with UConn. Uh, perfect world is UConn wins by 23 and then Purdue wins by seven. And then we get to bet UConn over Purdue one more time. Yes. And, uh, we, 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 we make our April bankroll. And there is a prop bet for the exact matchup and who wins and UConn to beat Purdue in the finals is like minus minus one fifteen. I'm not against taking that as well. But I've already got a lot of futures in the UConn that I'm going to hopefully cash, knock on wood. So I'm just saying that for our listeners. I don't know that I'll do it. But um, all right. Uh, what else? Tell them about Jay's Plays. Jay's Plays is our afternoon email uh, pick Monday through Friday. We offer a handful of picks about those evenings or some future options. You can sign up at timesfreepress.com and you can read my five at 10, which is my morning column at 10 a.m. Uh, Monday through Friday uh, at timesfreepress.com. Been doing it for now, uh, as we discussed, since Cam Newton was at Auburn. And uh, so it, it, it's it's got a little history there. There you go. There you go. You can find my work at Major uh, Wager. You can always find my picks uh, at Vegas Insider. And um, you got my Twitter handle. There, want to thank our friends at Bet Online. Thank our good friends, Southeastern 14. For Jay Greason, I'm Brian Edwards. Best of luck uh, with your bets on the Final Four. Enjoy the games, and we are over and out.